All right, so our speaker today is Carrie Robinette, and she is a grants management specialist for the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Branch. And she's going to be presenting on the application review tool that we use to review your sub applications as they come in. Um, Carrie, take it away. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, so I can't see the chat. So, Christy, are we good? Can you hear me? Yes, they are getting you loud and clear. Perfect. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, so, as Christy said, I do want you guys to stop me and ask questions as we're moving through this application review tool training. Um, it's going to be fairly informal. I don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that, but what I do do is take a blank art like you see on the screen or should see on the screen and we walk through it, talk about some of the features, then we're gonna show you some examples of a completed art. And there's just a couple of things that you're gonna hear me say over and over again and that's because I, these are kind of the key things I want you to take away from it. And that is the application review tool or art is what it says it is in its name. It's a tool to help us as FEMA work with you as our state partners to get application reviews completed. But it's also a tool for you as our state partners to work with your subrecipients because if you complete the art, it's going to tell you whether or not you have a complete application or if there's information and data gaps that you need to work with your sub applicants on um, to complete. So the first takeaway that I hope you get from today is it's an effective tool to help with application reviews. But the second takeaway is probably the most important, which is fill the art out as completely as possible use as many comments as possible to tell a story about the application that you're looking for. So before we kind of dive into that, um, what you see on the screen is a blank art. And I want to walk through and talk about some of the features of the art that are there to kind of help you um, walk through an application and determine if it's cost effective, eligible, and meets all the criteria outlined in the 2015 HMA guidance, the 2 CFR, and the 44 CFR, which is our prevailing guidance documents that we use under FEMA HMA programs. And one of the things that you should see in the different pods on the screen is there is a pod that has links to those different guidance documents. So there's a link to the 2015 HMA guidance, the guidance addendum, the 2 CFR part, part 200, and then the 44 CFR part 206.434, which is the HMA program guidance. So having said all of that, let's dive into the art itself. So a couple of general comments. Um, the art is filled with many different tabs. And if you look down at the bottom, um, you'll see we have general criteria, cost review, cost effectiveness review, and then it goes into project specific tabs for generators, mitigation reconstruction, drainage projects, the various different types of project types we see most often. Um, so starting up at the very top on tab A, just a couple of things to point out. When you're reviewing a project, make sure that you fill out this top part of the art because this is the general information about your project in terms of what state you're working in, the FEMA project number, the state project number if there is one, the project title, who the subgrantee is, the subgrantee type, whether it is a state level agency or state institution, federally recognized tribal government, public or tribal college or university, um, local jurisdiction or a private nonprofit if you're operating in the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program or HMGP. And then it talks about the cost share. 
And one of the things about the art as you're filling it in, some of the cells are going to change when you put information in it. So let's just say you have an application where the federal share is $75,000. The non-federal share, unless it's changed by a waiver from the 75-25, the non-federal share would be $25,000. And you'll see these, these lines changing color as you complete the information. So then you put in the total project cost, which should be $100,000. And the art's going to validate that the non-federal share is within that typical 75-25 cost share. And then we have information on who the state reviewer is and who the FEMA reviewer is. So this comes into play and is, is, and is in an, an apartment, bleh. it's an important piece of information for us on the FEMA side to know because when we get an art and an application, we want to know who we communicate back with. And you as a grant specialist should know um, who your FEMA counterpart is. You know, so if it's me working with someone in the state of Texas or Christy, who's our moderator today, um, is our tribal liaison or was our tribal liaison. So you know, it's important to have those points of contact and you can put that information on the art so that we know who to communicate back with. And then you're looking at which HMA program you're operating in. So whether that be HMGP, BRIC, or FMA, the art's used across all three programs. And one of the things you're going to see is there are some cells that says for HMGP only, for all programs and different things like that, indicating that, you know, for different programs, there might be slight differences in requirements. So it's important to note what program you're working in. And we'll move down to the meat of the art. And I want to point out a couple of things that truly does make this a tool for us as grant reviewers. So you'll notice in column G that this is a bunch of different references from the 2015 HMA guidance. So as you're walking through this, and it also lists the 44 CFR. So as you're walking through this, if you are looking at one of these questions in column B and you want to know specific guidance as to why we are asking for what we're asking for in the application review tool or as part of our grant review, these references are a good tool back that you, you can go to and look up where that requirement comes from. Then if you look over in column B, there's several cells with these questions that you'll notice have red flags in the top right hand corner. Those flags are additional information and tips and tricks and comments that are additional support in reviewing an application and providing more guidance in looking at whether or not an application answers these questions. So for instance, um, going down to question A12, do all the properties included in the subgrant application have flood insurance? If you just put your cursor over that cell, you'll see some notes that pop up in that yellow box. Those comments are there to provide additional guidance and thoughts on how the application should address that particular requirement. And again, this is one that is specific to HMA and has to be yes for HMA since that is that program is grounded in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, so again, when you highlight over these cells with the red flags, you'll see a lot of different comments that come up that are an additional guide. So any questions so far? Okay. So that's some of the the general comments that 
about the art that I wanted to go through. And there's a couple of cells on here that I want to spend a little time talking about. Um, in questions A4 and A5 that I've highlighted here, these two questions really center on whether or not there is a potential for a duplication of benefits or a duplication of programs. One of the things that we would ask on the FEMA side from you as our state partners is to look at your applications before they're submitted and let us know, number one, if those applications have been submitted under another one of the grant programs and whether or not they have been funded. Because obviously if it's been funded under one program already, we can't fund it under a different program because that's going to be a duplication of programs. But A4, which talks about has it been previously submitted, is an important question because if it has been submitted under another grant program, for instance, if you have an application that you've submitted under HMGP under a disaster, but it hasn't been funded yet, so you as a state and a sub-applicant decide you want to submit that application under the national competitive funding under BRIC, that's fine. We just need to know that. And a lot of times we can't, we don't have an easy view on the FEMA side of applications being submitted under each of the programs side by side so that we can see that. Um, we do have a little bit of a capability, but the problem that we run into is that if you submit an application under HMGP and then that application gets submitted under BRIC or FMA and you change the title of that project in the slightest, between the different programs, then it's not going to show up as submitted under both. So what we would ask is that you guys, you know, pay attention to that question and work with your schmoes or your other grant partners to ensure that if they have been submitted under multiple programs that we know that and that it's just noted here on the art. The next one that I wanted to point out really quick, just because we see, or at least from my perspective, um, these questions always have an RFI comment on them. And that is whether what the US Congressional District is in A37 and what the state legislative district is. And believe it or not, I look at applications and we double check that and there's a reason that we do that and you would be surprised at how often the congressional districts and state legislative districts have to be updated because they're not listed properly in the application. I looked at one the other day where the state legislative district in the application said district 2 but it was in state district 134. So there's a website called govtrack.com that if you're looking at an acquisition or a reconstruction, it's just as simple as going in and putting in some of the addresses, participating in that application and verifying that congressional district. Um, and the same thing with a flood mitigation project. If you put um, lats and longs or or if a flood mitigation project is going to benefit a particular group of houses, you can take a couple of those addresses and put it in that website and um, double check that congressional or state legislative district. So, you know, keep those in mind as well. Um, and the reason that that's important is because if you look in Question A41, it talks about a large project notification. And this is not something that you as our state partners typically deal with. It's something that FEMA walks through anytime there is an application where the federal share is in excess of a million dollars. When we have those projects, we have to go back through FEMA headquarters and the Office of Management and Budget to notify them of these projects and then the congressional offices get notified that the federal government 
is about to award money in excess of a million dollars in their their districts so that they can do public notices and different things that they want to do. Carrie, I'm sorry, we have a question in the chat. Uh, Rebecca, asked, Rebecca asked, I searched for that web address. It looks like it may be govtrack.us. Is that correct? It could be. Sorry about that if I got the dot com in error, but it is GovTrack. So let's see. I can pull that up real quick. It is GovTrack.us. And if you scroll down, you'll see find your representative and senators. And if you put in an address, so I'll go ahead and put in 288 Denton, Texas. When I put in an address, you'll see a map pop up on your right, and then it'll list the two state senators, which is John Cornyn and Ted Cruz. And then we're in District 26 with Congressman Michael Burgess. So it gives you that information when you put an address in. So any other questions on tab A? Okay. So moving to tab B, this is the cost review. And one of the things I want to point second. out here. One second, Carrie. One second. Sure. Um, Hannah Rosa has raised, raised her hand. Um, Hannah, you can unmute and ask your question. Or type in the chat. <laughs> Anna, I don't see your microphone connected. Question, yes. Section okay, A, now can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Okay. What's your question, Hannah? Can you hear me? Yes, can you Hello. hear us? Hi, Anna. Can you hear us? Hello? Yes, Hannah, can you hear us? Hi, Anna. Maybe not. All right. Anna, maybe try talk, typing your question in the chat if there's a tech issue going on. Uh, my question is this. Uh, on the site that we are given as a reference in order to find information about the flood zone in a special hazard flood zone uh, in Section mm -hmm. 8, uh, we pull up the yes. maps normally on that site. Uh, would you like for us to indicate the zone specifics when we're putting that information in? Like if it's in, it notes the legend says AE zone or whatever the results are for that particular question. Uh, would that be helpful if we did that? Or should we just indicate the yes or no answer? No, that's a great point. Please include the zone. So that'll let us know that you've looked at it and that it is most definitely in a special flood hazard area. So if it's in zone AE, please note that. So one of the things uh, that we're going to do in just a minute. One second, Carrie. Sure. Um, Terrell, did you have a question? All right, Terrell did not have a question. Thank you. Go on. Sure. Um, 
So one of the things that I am going to show you guys in just a minute is the more comments that you put on the art, the better. So to your point, Hannah, when you're looking at question A8, which is about the special flood hazard area, yeah, you could just put a yes, but it's always better to add more comments and say we've you know, we verified it, it is in the floodplain and it's listed in this particular flood zone. So take advantage of that space in column D and put as many comments as you can about what you're seeing in your applications. Because one of the things that's going to do is it's going to help me as a FEMA reviewer know that, hey, they've looked at it, they identified these issues, you know, so we can move on with our review because it's already been taken care of and it's going to make my review that much faster. So the more comments okay. that you put, the better. Okay. All right. So we're going to move to, col to column or tab B, which is the cost review. Okay, and one second, Carrie. Okay. We have a we have a question. Um, sure. Um, I think someone just asked oh, asked had their hand raised, but I don't see it anymore. Um, if that was you, um, Meryl, yes, please go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Okay, um, so if you have a question, come off mute and ask or throw your question in the chat and we will go ahead and move on and start talking about column B and we can come back to any questions that may come up. Okay, Meryl is typing. Okay. Meryl asks, can you describe what you're looking for in the scope of work? So in the scope of work, let's get back here. So a lot of these questions and a lot of the project specific questions are leading up to ensuring that you have a complete scope of work. When I look at a scope of work, and I try and answer this question in A15 on the art, I want to see that they have answered the who, what, when, where, and hows of the proposed project. So who's going to be involved and who it's going to benefit, what the problem is that's going to be solved by the, app, the proposed project, and what the proposed project is. And then who's who's going to be involved in implementing that project, when it's going to take place, and how it's going to be implemented. So if you think of it from that perspective, the who, what, when, where, why, and hows, if you can answer those questions from looking at a scope of work, then you should have a pretty complete scope of work. All right, Meryl's typing. Um, Meryl says to include like the milestones or the period of performance. Well, I mean, when you're looking at a work schedule on an application and when you get to those questions on the art, because there's, there's several questions about um, how long will it take from project start to complete the proposed project. So in A16, it's asking um, how long your project's gonna take to complete. So if you're looking at the work schedule and the period of performance, 
then your work schedule should include or be within that 36 month period of performance. So if your project takes 24 months, you're good. If it takes 21 months, you're good. If it takes 39, not so good. But your work schedule should outline all of the tasks that need to be completed in order to um, complete that project or fully implement that project. And it should be reflective of that scope of work. So if you're doing a drainage project and you look at your work schedule and it has tasks for an elevation, there might be a little bit of an issue there. So you just want to look and make sure that it's consistent with your scope of work and that that work schedule is within the period of performance and that it makes sense for that project. And questions A16 and A17 on the art provides um, some additional guidance and references to where it talks about the work schedules. Meryl says thank you. All right. So jumping over to column B, or tab B, this is about the cost estimate. And I will tell you that when I look at an application, the bulk of my comments on this tab are going to be in cells B1 and B2. Because this is where we look for whether or not the cost estimate is consistent with the scope of work and the proposed project. This is where we look at the budget and whether or not it's broken out effectively, um, meaning does it have line items for materials that need to be purchased? Does it have the equipment that needs to be used? Does it account for any labor? that needs to be hired in order to complete the project. And we want to see whether there's unit cost per line item and a total for that line item. So it needs to be broken out in such a way that we can determine that the cost for that project is reasonable, necessary, and allocable. So one of the links that you have in the pod is to the two CFR. And so when I look at an application and I'm looking at questions B1 and B2, I constantly refer back to the two CFR 200.404 and 405 and whether or not a cost estimate is sufficient to determine reasonableness and necessity for that project. And I also look for the budget narrative. And when I look at, do you have a question? Yes, there are questions. Um, what about for phase projects? So we are going to talk about a phase project in just a few minutes. So with a phase project, we do look for the same information on the budget. The the comment that I can give you on a phase project is if it's a phased, we want to see in the scope of work that it clearly says we're going to be phasing this project. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, what phase one consists of and what phase two consists of, which typically is going to be phase one with design and engineering and phase two construction. And that's very general, but we want to at least see what tasks are going to be completed under the, each phase. And then for the cost estimate, my comments on the art usually say I can't distinguish between the cost for phase one and phase two, so it needs to be clearly delineated. So those are the kind of comments that I would put on the art if, if the cost estimate doesn't say here's phase one, here's phase two. All right. Um, let's see. Miss Yolanda had a question. Let's see what Miss Yolanda said. Yeah. 
Um, so for looking at the budget also, I look for a budget narrative. So part of B1 says is the budget narrative provided that shows how the estimate was calculated and ties the budget components um, to the project. So when I get a budget narrative, a lot of times the budget narratives that we see from, from our state partners and our subrecipients do a good job of kind of explaining what the cost is. What they don't do is they don't give us the source documentation for how those costs were derived. So it doesn't say the $25 per hour for this person managing this project is part of USA County's um, typical budget or it doesn't say things like the $60,000 for that 48 inch box culvert that's being, that's replacing a smaller 32 inch box culvert. The cost comes from RS means or some other, other pricing guide. So we have to have the budget narrative needs to show where those costs come from. And it does, we need that because we want to see that those costs are grounded in some kind of truth. Because what we're trying to, to do with that is avoid, you know, going back and forth with budget modifications and you as a, as a state or your subrecipients running the risk of not being able to um, get reimbursed for some costs that, that you've laid out for these materials or that piece of equipment because it wasn't um, assessed properly in the cost estimate. So we just wanna know that you've done your due diligence as a subrecipient and as the state looking at the estimate to make sure it's grounded in some truth. And that's what the budget narrative does. And then um, whether or not the costs are generally reasonable, necessary, and allocable in section B2, um, usually I have a lot of comments there. And it's basically, you know, saying, please provide a budget narrative that outlines where the cost came from. So I'll show you an example of this in just a minute when we look at a, a project specific application. And the other comment that I will say on the art is don't be afraid to do the math. So in question B5, it talks about the 5% subrecipient management cost. And with that 5%, it's 5% of the project cost, total project cost. So what I do on my arts when I look at this is I say, here's the total project cost. Here's what 5% of that total project cost is. And then whatever that request for subrecipient management cost is, I'll list that out to ensure that it's below that 5% cap that is eligible for subrecipient management cost. So for FMA, it's a little bit different because the, the subrecipient management cost is based on the project and that project's um, cost share. So it is a little bit different for FMA, but for BRIC and HMGP, it's based on 5% of that project total cost. So again, don't be afraid to do the math and lay it out on the art because when I see that, if I get that from the state and I can quickly look at their comments and, and look at the cost estimate and verify their math, that's gonna make my review that much quicker. So again, the more comments you put, the better. And then looking at any pre-award. Don't be afraid to list out the pre-award cost and lay that out as a picture on the art. And with on B11 for the non-federal share commitment letters, in some applications it may identify, you know, the such and such county drainage district will provide the match through their capital improvement budget. Okay, that's great. 
but that in the application is not enough for us to make sure that that 25% is fully accounted for. We need a letter signed by that entity that's providing the 25% acknowledging that is going to help. So um, we do need that letter. So in B11, the comments should be, here's the letter dated so-and-so or dated such-and-such such date by so-and-so and it confirms that the match is fully accounted for. Oh, we have a question, Karen. Some jurisdictions sure. uh, do the match commitment in the form of a resolution, and is that acceptable? Yes. So you can say that a resolution approved by your county commissioners or police jurors in Louisiana um, is acceptable and dated this date. So as long as there is some kind of resolution or letter or something signed by the entity providing the non-federal share, you're good to go. So moving on to tab C, this is the cost effectiveness tab where we're looking at the BCA. So anytime I do this training, I tell people cost effectiveness is challenging. I am not an engineer. I am not a BCA expert. And I am fortunate enough that FEMA has a good team of, of technical specialists that can look at a BCA and provide guidance on whether or not it's completed accurately and is properly supported with documentation. On the art though, we as grant specialists, whether or not you're, you're comfortable with BCAs or some kind of a BCA expert, you should be able to complete a lot of the information on the art. So, for instance, if you look at these first two questions, it talks about how they can or the methodology they use to complete the BCA. So, for instance, if they use pre-calculated benefits or if they use the FEMA BCA toolkit, that's what we want to see here. And it's got a drop down where you can select it. So. The second question is um, if it's 5% initiative. So if you have a 5% project, the reason it's under 5% in one of those kind of specialty projects is because it can't be supported by a typical BCA. But that doesn't preclude having to submit a BCA narrative that at least provides some assessment of whether or not that project is cost effective. So you can look at your project, and if it's a 5%, be able to say, yeah, they provided a, a BCA narrative to explain that that cost is effective or cost effective, which BCA modules were used. So if your application package was completed when you got it from the sub-applicant, sub it should include a BCA Excel file and PDF report. If you have those two attachments, you should be able to open those two documents and answer this question because they have either used the DFA Riverine module or they could have used multiple modules. So it'll tell you in the BCA reports what modules they use to complete it. And if they use the 6.0 software, you should be able to tell that as well from opening those attachments. Whether or not there's a BCA narrative that was included in the application can be answered because all they're asking for here is whether or not that attachment was received. Is the calculated benefit cost ratio a one or more? The attachments to for the BCA are going to tell you what that benefit cost ratio is, right? So don't be afraid to open those attachments and review them and try your best to answer the questions on the cost effectiveness section of the art because you should be able to answer a lot of these by just looking at those attachments. 
The other thing it's going to do is it's going to give you that much more familiarity with your project. You're going to know, hey, they had this much in benefits and this much cost and damage. And all of these different components that are filtered into your project on the program side as a grant specialist, that's good for me to know because that's going to tell me whether or not I truly do have a project that is going to provide mitigation benefits. It's going to solve that problem. So from a program side, it's beneficial for me to have a grasp of the BCA. We have a question, Carrie. Um, Holly sure. says on this page, there's a question asking if more than one hazard type was used. Can an applicant complete mm -hmm. multiple modules using the same address but using different hazard types? So from what I understand, yes. But that, again, I'm not a BCA expert, but I have seen that. So I rely on our tech team to be able to kind of validate some of those inputs. But I do believe you can do it that way, Holly. And then it asks questions about whether or not pre-calculated benefits or an alternative BCA approach was used and does it meet the criteria for you. So the biggest example here is if you're using pre-calculated benefits, the memo is very specific in that the structures, for instance, have to be in the special flood hazard area. So as you're looking at your applications and looking in terms of cost effectiveness, you can look at the properties involved in like an acquisition and tell whether or not those structures are in the special flood hazard area. And if that community is applying the pre-calculated benefits to those structures and they're in, then they're good. But if they're not listed in this, the special flood hazard area, then you know that's an issue and you can identify that on the art and work with, with your states or your sub applicants to um, address those deficiencies or make sure um, that gets clarified and addressed. And there are some questions on here that, you know, I typically wait for our technical team to come back. And one of them is, um, was the BCA committed or completed accurately? Well, I tend to rely on, again, our tech team to be able to give me those comments back. So I, I can't answer everything because I'm not a BCA expert, but I do try and answer as much as I can on this tab. And we would like to see you guys take a stab at doing that as well and kind of getting more familiar with BCAs. All right, so any other questions on this cost effectiveness tab? Yes, we All have right. a question. So we're not, okay. Uh, what are they looking for exactly for question C10? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, so when we look at level of protection, that means for like a drainage project, for instance, did they provide documentation to be able to tell me that after the work is completed, the base flood elevation is going to be reduced by a half a foot? Um, do they expect those those infrastructure improvements to reduce the base flood elevation and how much. Um, for an elevation project, um, you could look for things like they're going to elevate houses to, to two foot above freeboard so that they're reasonably safe from flooding. Um, for generator applications, it's a little more difficult because they're not necessarily doing work to prevent flooding. What they're doing is providing redundant power. So with this one, I usually say it's a generator project to re provide redundant power to a critical facility. 
which is the level of protection expected. So it just depends on what project you're doing and whether or not you can tell from your application that they're going to lower the base flood elevation, they are protecting these houses by elevating them two foot above the 500 year or two foot above 100 year floodplain. Just something to say, this is, this is what we, we think the damage reduction will look like. Okay, we have another question. Can you also explain C13? How do we answer that question or agree with it? So I will do my best, but again, I am not a BCA expert. So um, the BCAs can either be based off of historic damages where you have a somewhat finite recurrence interval that can be established based on prior events. So if you're looking at a drainage project or even a generator project, for instance, where you have documentation to say, we've lost power for 24 hours in one day, you know, once every two years or seven days over the last 48 years. 48 years, however much that looks like or how often that occurs, that's based on historic damage and that has to be supported by documentation from prior losses. For professional expected damages, um, my understanding is that when you have like a drainage project and an H&H &H project is run, um, and you don't, or, not necessarily a drainage project, but a generator. Let's use that as a better example. Um, with the generator project, a lot of times communities don't have the historic data or they don't have access to good records to support a, a BCA based on historic damages. But they do have something where an engineer or um, someone can come in and say, based on this certain set of criteria, we expect future losses to look like this going forward. Um, so there's, there's a difference in the level of documentation that's associated with whether or not you're using historic or professionally expected damages. And that's as, about as clear um, as I can get with it. Again, I'm, I'm not a BCA expert, but that's kind of my understanding. Thank you. No more questions at this time. All right. So I don't want to spend a lot of time here looking at um, project-specific tabs because we're going to go more into that on in just a moment. So, okay, let's do this. So on these project-specific tabs, um, based on in tab A, the type of project that you select, you're going to find the tab for drainage. So on tab A, we had project type 403.1, stormwater management culverts. And so I'm going to look at project tab G for drainage projects. And there was a question earlier asked by someone about what do I look for in a scope of work? These questions are going to basically help you assess your scope of work that you have and whether or not it's sufficient for that project type. So you have questions like, um, do they talk about what land use type or whether or not the application, again, specifies a level of protection because we need to know what the project or what the problem is, what the proposed project is going to be and what they expect from a project. How how much protection do they they plan to to get once this is implemented? Um, so these project specific questions lead you to kind of walking through your scope of work and the associated documentation and and provides an assessment of whether or not you have a complete scope of work. 
so as you move through these project specific questions, if you if you have to answer no on some of these, and then as FEMA reviewers, if we answer info needed, we know that there's a gap in the data. So, you know, is this proposed project a floodplain and stream restoration project? Well, if it's no, that's okay because it's not that type of a project, so you're going to hit no. And then we would concur with that because it's a culvert improvement project. So it's okay to answer no, it just depends on the question. But if you have to answer a question in such a way that you're indicating that you don't have enough information to answer that question, then you know you have a gap and you need to address it with either your state partner or as a state, your subrecipient or subapplicant. So what I want to do now is instead of going through these project specific tabs here, I want to show you guys an example of an art and how I use it when I do a project review. So I'm going to jump over to this art. So I have information completed up above. I've completed the federal cost, non-federal cost, and total cost up here. And I have contact information for our state and then my contact information here. And the reason the green is still blank is because I'm still working through this particular application with the state. So, but once that review is completed, I would put a date there. But one of the things I want you to take note of is, is the comments that I have here. So when I got this application from the state and they actually submitted an art with it, but the art had no comments and some of the questions and their responses in column C were blank. So there, there was basically nothing here for me to know that this application had been really assessed by our state partners. So I filled in information here so that it would be complete when I did my review and answered, provided a response in column E, and then you'll see the level of comment that I put in the FEMA comments section. And what I do is I put what I see. So like for this one, for instance, um, it's a generator project and the facility that they wanted to put the generator at was under construction. It was a brand new community facility, which is fine. The problem is in the scope of work, it made me think that the, the contractors that were building the facility were going to go ahead and do the work on the pad for the generator and install the hookups, which they were requesting funding for as part of this project. So in my comments, I put what I, I saw in the scope of work, that the facility needing the proposed generator was under construction and looks to have been completed in November of 2020. And I asked them to verify that they didn't go ahead and purchase and install the generator and transfer switch during the construction process. So they responded to my RFI on June 7th. So I followed my comments through two more rounds of RFIs. So on this side, I have comments from June 7th and comments from July 6th. So when they submitted a response to their RFI, the initial RFI I sent on June 7th, the documentation included photos that looked like it had a brand new generator pad that had been poured and installed. And there was a picture of a fuel tank sitting there. So I commented on that <coughs> and I included the reference to the 44 CFR, or I'm sorry, the um, HMA guidance that said project for which actual physical work has already been done or not eligible cost and sent this back to them as part of another RFI and asked them to remove the cost for the pad and the fuel tank. 
So when they responded on July 6th, they had done what I asked on that front, and I was able to say that, yes, they had satisfied that requirement. So I concurred on it and changed my response here from info needed to concur. So the point here is to put comments on what you see, and the art can be used to follow your review of an application through even the review process or RFI process. And you can make comments based on the documentation received on each round of RFI. And for, we had a question earlier about the special flood hazard area. So let me find that question. Okay. I have so many comments here that it's jumping around on me. So let's do this. Okay, so we had a question earlier about the comments needed to answer a question on 8.8 about the special flood hazard area. So you'll see that not only do I look for the firm to be included as part of the application, but I go to the MAP Service Center and validate that. And there were some additional comments about the, the community's participation in the NFIP that I added here. Um, so my comment here was also no maps of the location were provided, a firm should be provided. So we wanna see that map and we wanna know what, what flood zone they're in. So, the comment that I got or the information that I got back showed was a map that showed that the site was outside of the special flood hazard area. So there were other issues with this one, but we I go to the map service center and I verify the flood zone myself, even when I do have a firm just to kind of double check everything. For the work schedule, the current work schedule should be reviewed for possible needed revisions based on the current schedule. 12 of the 14 months were for site work, utilities, and facility construction. So they submitted an, a work schedule for this one where the tasks were basically for the construction of the new facility and not the installation of the generator. So when you look at a work schedule, it does need to be consistent with the project that's being proposed. And it can't be something off the wall like construction of a new facility. So you want to double check that as well. So you'll see again, the point is level of comments. On the cost review, I mentioned that B1 and B2 on tab B were where I put the bulk of my comments when reviewing an application. So you'll see here, let me go back up a little bit. There's a lot of comments here. And the comments address whether or not there was a budget narrative, there were issues with um, some of the line items, I believe, on this one um, weren't sufficiently broken out. There were just a couple of different things that they needed to address. So we RFI'd that one. They responded, there were still issues with it. They broke it out, um, but there were line items that lended more to subrecipient management costs rather than project costs. So we had them address those as well. So again, use the, use the art to kind of talk about what you see because that's gonna lead you in a direction of developing an RFI if there are any data gaps. And the other thing that I look for here, when I'm looking at the art in an application, the, the costs also have to be consistent with what's in NEMAS. If it's under um, HMGP or under FEMA GO, if it's under BRIC or FMA, the project costs need to be consistent with what is in the application in our systems of record. So if it wasn't consistent there, that would have been noted on the art as well.
And when I talk about doing the math, You'll see here in, in question B4 about the subrecipient management cost, I did the math on this one because it wasn't done on the art when I got it. I started out doing the math and double checking all of the numbers and their yeah, request wasn't consistent. Yeah. Okay. Um property inventory in the notes it states for region 10 is that needed for FEMA region 6 so yes we look for the same thing in region 6 so the art, was so the art has gone 10. you know I don't know the answer to that Christy do you Yes, so the art was developed in Region 10 first. That's why it says that. Yeah, but we, we follow the same, same guidelines here in Region 6. So again, don't be afraid to, to do the math and kind of lay things out on the art so that when I get it, if you are putting together the art as the state and I see comments here, that's going to make my review that much faster. Again, can't stress that enough just because um, it's going to let me know that you've already looked at it and you are already commenting on that, yep, it meets that 5% cap for that particular program. So utilize that comment section as heavily as you can. Cost effectiveness tab. So I, again, did the best I could in answering a lot of these questions. Um, for this question on C9, this is the one where it asks if the BCA was completed accurately. These comments that I have here Initially, the comment I had was awaiting final comments from tech. And then I got comments back from our technical folks and was able to complete that using the information I got back from them. If you as a state need help assessing a BCA and you don't feel confident in answering this particular question, for instance, that's fine. Put in the comment on this in column D that the BCA needs further assessment by FEMA technical team in order to ensure that it was completed accurately. It's perfectly fine to say that and, and put that comment in here. Um, because again, we're not all BCA experts, but do your best to answer the rest of the questions and put comments in column D so that at the very least, again, you're familiar with your project and we can tell that it's been looked at and we can move a little bit faster in assessing applications. And then it's the same thing with, with project specific tabs. As much as you can fill this out and as many comments as you can put, the better. Paint me a picture in the art of what this application looks like. And again, that's going to help both you work with your sub recipients or sub applicants to ensure that the application is complete before it comes to FEMA, because there's nothing that says you can't fill the art out on the state side. And if you see data gaps and trying to answer these questions, then you can go back to your sub applicant and say, hey, I need you to provide me this before we could submit your application. So it, you know, use this to your advantage. And if you go through that process, that's going to reduce the number of RFIs that you as a state get back from FEMA. And it's going to help your sub recipient as well. So it, it kind of helps on both fronts since our state partners are kind of our mediators and pass throughs in between.
so I also want to show an example of a phased project art because we do get those. So one of the things in the scope of work for a phase project that we look for is, does it clearly state that it's a phase project? And does it outline what phase one is going to consist of and what phase two tasks are going to be? So it's noted, I put that comment on the art. And we move through using this art to assess phase one only. And for phase two, I have kind of done it both ways where when I get phase two, I use the phase one art and just address um, where I had comments that said will be addressed during phase two because I do add that onto a phase project art. Where on phase one, if it's something that's going to be technical and developed during phase one implementation, I'll note that on the art and say to be received through phase one deliverables. So when I get those deliverable deliverables back, I've done it both ways where I've gone under that comment and put the date that the phase one deliverables were received and what it looks like and any comments based on those deliverables that I get. I've also done a separate art for phase two where we get the deliverables back and I take all of it and I start over with a new art depending on the level of complexity with that project and I have filled out a new art assessing the phase one deliverables and whether or not we can move it forward to phase one for phase two approval for construction. So I've done it both ways. Um, and it really depends for me on the complexity of the project and whether or not it, the initial art for phase one can be utilized effectively to kind of distinguish between phase one and phase two. So it's really just your call. I've done it both ways and both ways are effective. Um, but you want to use the art to assess those phase one deliverables as well. So, this is a drainage project. So I'll jump over to that project tab and you'll see like on G13, it asks to describe construction activities. So my comment here was because this is a phase project, phase one deliverables will include a revised scope of work that will need to describe in detail the proposed construction activities. Because for this one, they, they were kind of on that fine line that we, that we look at between whether or not it should really be project scoping where they really don't have an idea of how to solve a problem and what a proposed project would be versus a phase project where you may have a little bit more detail and you know what your pro proposed project is going to be. You just don't have all those technical bits in place. So you're going to phase it to fill in those data gaps. So on this one, it kind of walked that fine line where they, they had enough information to describe what they thought the proposed project was going to be, but they really didn't have much in the way of technical information. So we approved phase one, knowing that all of these data gaps were going to be, were going to be filled based on those deliverables. So any, any questions on phase project and how to use the art with a phase project? I don't see any questions yet. All right, so you guys are being awfully quiet. So I will show you one more item, and that is the RFI form that FEMA uses whenever we have information needed on an application. A lot of you have probably seen this, but 
the way that I utilize this document for my project reviews is when I have items like on G11 where, actually let's go back to the regular project art. So when I'm looking here at this project and I have items that I cannot sign off on and say that yes, the question has been answered. I'm going to take this and I'm going to take the blank RFI form and under this budget section here, I'm going to take this comment right here based on what is still outstanding and I'm going to put that on the art and I'm going to say please review the application scope of work and budget to remove the cost for the pad installation and fuel tank. And I am going to use this RFI to communicate back with my state and the state with their sub applicants so that we can fill in the data gaps identified on the art. So really, if you do use the art to your advantage and you fill it out completely, it's going to tell you what you need for an application and it's going to help you fill out this RFI so you know what to ask for and what data gaps there are. We have a question. Sure. Can you please provide an example of a budget Excel that I can reference back to? I have an idea. I just want to make sure. So you're asking if I can show you an example of a budget that would be broken out enough? I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. And Meryl's typing yes, that's what Meryl wants to. Okay, so let's see, because I do have, I do have a budget worksheet. Let's do it this way. Right. Okay. So this is a budget that we got for a generator project. Looking at this, it's not broken out enough. It doesn't have anything for the cost of labor because the generator is not going to install itself. The pad's not going to install itself. The transfer switch is not going to install itself, right? So this is an example that I like to pull out to say with this, there's a lot more information. Like for the generator, they do a, an okay job because they have the generator line item. They're buying one. This is how much it's going to cost for that generator. So the total cost is for that line item is $25,000. So it's kind of an example of both where that, that particular line item is fine. And that's kind of the, the level of breakout that we want to see. The problem is on this one, they should have a line item for labor that includes number of hours, hourly rate, and a total for installing that generator. They should have hourly rates for installing that concrete pad and the materials needed to install that concrete pad. Is there a cost associated with that transfer switch? You know, something to that effect to basically show me that they have accounted for all of the cost. So this one is not a good, I show this one because it's not a good example and that I would RFI this back and ask for more information on this. And then I had another example, but it's not opening for me. Okay, so make this 
this is a much better example of a budget for a generator application because it has procurement for the contractor, selection, design work, the cost to purchase, delivery and installation, and closeout cost. It talks about the in-kind cost that's you, that they're going to use to meet the non-federal share. It talks about management cost, and it breaks out the management cost by um, personnel, unit cost, number of hours, all of this information broken out. This is the level of detail, a much better example of the level of detail we want to see for a budget. And to go along with that, here's their budget narrative. So you can see that they do provide additional documentation or comments on the hourly rate and providing some justification for those costs. The one thing that I did RFI back on this one is that they didn't tell me where this $25 an hour came from. Is that the typical hourly rate for the emergency management staff and how was that established? So that's the kind of detail that the budget narrative should include. It should include comments on the cost, what it's for, but it should also be able to tell me where that $25 an hour rate came from. Okay, we have a question. And if it doesn't, I'm going to put, okay. Um, Hannah asks, if you received this cost breakdown separately, and grants management system reflected the first spreadsheet with only a few items, would you send it back since the cost breakdown was extensive? To clarify, you received three line items and on a separate document, you received the extensive document. So are you saying if I received this and another attachment for this same project that broke it out more, would I send it back? I think Hannah is asking if the three line items were in, say, Nemus, but they sent you the, the mm -hmm. real breakdown separately. Would that Got it. Yes. No, it would not. So Nemus can be a booger. I have issues with it timing out on me and all of these things, but... I don't want to see, even if you sent me an attachment that was more broken out than what you see here on the screen, I would expect the more extensive budget to also be in NEMAS. Because what we approve on paper needs to be reflective of what we see in NEMAS. So I would RFI back to do a NEMAS update when I go to do the approval to say, please update the budget in NEMAS to reflect the more extensive cost breakdown. Because you have to remember, when we get a paper application or, you know, a digital copy of an application, what we look at there, somebody at headquarters may not see, right? So I, and because NEMIS is our system of record, it has to sync up and be consistent with what we see in either NEMIS or FEMA Go, whether it's um, BRIC, FMA, or HMGP using NEMIS. The budgets need to be reflective. The scope of work needs to be reflective. So I look at both systems when I'm working either FMA or NEMAS. Um, I look at both systems. And if I can't tell from the same information in the system as I do on paper, that, that is an RFI back for me.
So any other questions? I see no other questions. All right, well, that's really all I had. Um, you know, f feel free to email or um, come back to your FEMA rep with any questions and we'll get those answered. Um, and don't be afraid to, unless you're already doing this, send the art to your sub applicants. You know, send it to them and say, hey, before you submit your applications, please fill this out and send it back because they can put comments in, you know, either one of the state or FEMA columns on the art. They can put comments here on their application and by seeing this and knowing that you as their, their state reviewer and us as the FEMA reviewers are looking at the same questions and the same document to assess applications, it would probably be a benefit to them to have it and say, use this as a guide to put your application together and then fill it out and let me know where things are. So it, it, it's a tool for your subrecipients as well. So, and with that, unless there's any more questions, it's all I have. All right, Ismail is typing in the chat. Ah, thank you, is what Ismail had to say. Thank you very much, Carrie, for that presentation. Um, remember that there is a file share pod where you can download that HMA application review tool. Um, there are also web links in the web pod um, with the hazard mitigation assistance and uh, the addendum guidance plus 2 CFR 200 and 44 CFR. Um, Natalie Davis asks, where is the recording going to be posted? Um, we can have the recording sent out to all the participants. And Meryl asks, can you show the budget narrative again? Carrie, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Um, my, I got kicked out for a second. So can I show the budget narrative again? Yes. Oops. So let me share my screen. Can you all see it? Maybe make it a little bigger. Okay. Meryl said thank you. Sure. All right. Um, last call for questions before we go. All right, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar today, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.